So here's what really starts to happen. You can't really see because of the screen, but on the top there are our end devices, right? Smartphones, laptops, browsers. And they're not actually just pub subbing to each other on our data stream network where one device is listening to a channel and the other device is publishing. Because in almost every use case, in any real application, people want to add business logic in between devices submitting data and devices consuming data. So it's not as simple as just messaging between end devices. You want to have your servers there. Now, there's some really good reasons to have your servers there. You want to archive data. You want to log it. You want to do some machine learning on it. You want to process it. But a lot of the kinds of things you want to do are very, very lightweight. And because of that, though, you see everyone pubs publishing down to their servers, doing a small little bit of processing, and then publishing the message right back out. And so even though you've got this big, loosely coupled messaging system, most of our customers were still launching servers, scaling out their servers, and really ramping up the cost of their deployments. And so I'll give you just a few ex examples of this, as silly as they may sound. Uh, we had a very large beverage company, and they, and they created a very large, um, a very large uh, chat application for a sporting event. And they, really, they wanted to keep it authentic, so they didn't really care much if people were going to use obscenities or bad language in the chat room. But the one thing they really didn't want was the mention of their competitor, right? Now because of that, every chat message got published down to a series of servers that they had to spin up and scale for huge spikes during this big sporting event. Strip out the name of their competitor, we'll call it uh, Gunk Soda, and replace it maybe with uh, Yummy Soda, uh, and, then, uh, and then republish the message back out. Now that design pattern, it turns out, isn't, isn't that silly. You see it for things like uh, any kind of mapping application. I, if I'm looking at a, at a screen with a bunch of, uh, say, taxis going around, um, I probably just want to see the taxis in a one mile radius. And you're not going to send all of the city's taxis down to the phone and let the phone filter that, it's too much data. So again, you need to filter that to some set of servers that can strip out, know your lat long, and just give you devices in a radius or cars within a radius of, of that area. Right? Uh, and the, 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 that same design pattern could have scaled. So imagine a rules engine where if your uh, living room light and your dining room light is on, you also want to trigger the garage door to open. Or if the garage door opens, you want to turn the house lights on. Again, it's a tiny bit of business logic that you may want to run somewhere in the cloud, but a lot of people were spinning up servers. Uh, sentiment analysis. So everyone's voting and saying happy, sad in a social application. Again, you need to take those, collect them, aggregate the total amount, and republish them back out. So in almost every case, we find that customers' game logic Right? Uh, a lot of game companies in, these new, in, the, in the new social gaming sort of vertical, um, because they don't have a lot of centralized servers running, they take one of the game players in a group of, say, anywhere from four to 20 people, and that, that phone, that device, one random player becomes the server. And if that player goes into a tunnel, uh, you know, the whole game stops. Or uh, that, that player always tends to win in any kind of timing tie battle. So what they want to usually do is have, you know, have a centralized place but they don't necessarily want to spin up a lot of servers like a World of Warcraft. So again, you see this pattern over and over again, and that's what got us to launch something called Public Functions a year ago. Something we'd talked about for a long time, went through a lot of design patterns for, and the idea was not to replace everyone's servers, because I think there's a lot of use cases where in almost every case you still need to have servers, you still want to have heavyweight processing. But for all these lightweight things I just gave an example of, you want to have that processing at the edge, as close to the device as possible, before the data gets into the server. And you want to have it under low latency. And so we built this thing called PubNub Functions, which we launched a year ago, specifically to, um, specifically to try to address that. And so I thought it'd be interesting to come up here, give a short demo of it, but also kind of talk about lessons learned. What do we get right? What do we get wrong? What are our customers doing with it? Where are they getting stuck? So I thought that'd be kind of an interesting, you know, companies are always launching products. They rarely go back a year later and say, like, ah, oh, we screwed up here. And this worked out really well, and this didn't work out well. How are we doing so far? Pretty good. All right. Good so far? OK. So for us, we wanted it to be uh, to use JavaScript because you know, a lot of our customers already knew it. We wanted to have a design pattern where if you sent a message to any of our edge points, that we could guarantee that in under 10 milliseconds, it would start to execute your code. And we wanted the code to be very short-lived. These aren't heavyweight processes. We actually codenamed this RAFTA, routing, aggregation, filtering, transformation, and augmentation. The idea being that you're just doing little bits of processing at the edge. We wanted it to auto-scale on a deploy, have no downtime upgrades. Um, we needed it to keep state, 
So how do we think about key fakes data across a wide area network with no centralized point of presence? So um, what we ended up launching was something like this. Um, going back to the yummy cola versus gunk cola example, in order to replace, if you get a JavaScript, it's one line of code there, I'll spit up to three lines, right? It's doing a search replace global case insensitive on the word yummy, replacing it with the word gunk, sorry, sorry, replacing the word gunk with the word yummy, and rewriting the message. And rather than streaming that back to your servers, what happens in, in PubNub functions is it would take and does take this line of code, you press a deploy button with a single click, it makes copies of that piece of code out to every edge point. Because wherever that device is publishing a chat message, it's going to go to that closest edge point. Europe, Japan, South America, US. And then that piece of code will execute on an event, that event being on a publish. Every time someone publishes a message into the network, it does that transformation of the code. We wanted it to have no, time, don't, no downtime upgrades, so when you push another version of your code, it would uh, launch it, drain traffic off the first, uh, the first kind of older version, spin up the new one, and once traffic was drained off in every region of the world, flip it back over. So we had that in place. And then I think more difficult, we wanted it to be able to keep state. So we created this you know, simple database, key value store, but not in one place. And we didn't want the developer to be, to be thinking about how this all worked. So the developer writes a lot of code like this. Let's say you're counting votes that are coming in. But remember, they're coming in from different publish points all over the world. This keeps state, so if you say increment count or vote equals you know, vote by one, what it does is it keeps track, replicates that to the other regions. And that way you get this eventually consistent model where the developer's not aware of where the data is being written to, but over the course of a second or less, you have a, an, an accurate count of votes, for example, coming in across all these different points of presence. So that was the initial version of PubNet blog, uh, PubNet. We call it Blocks PubNet Functions now. And we have actually um, added a lot of functionality to it over time. We've added REST endpoints, which we'll show today. We've added um, about to launch uh, Vault and some other really cool things uh, within it. But um, what I thought I'd do is give you kind of a, neat, a, a very nice visual idea of how this works. Any questions before I just jump in? All good? Okay. So let's see how this works here. So um, I'm going to go over here. And we have, a, we have an open source project called Project Eon, which takes D3.js charts and graphs. And it makes them real time. So what we're looking at right now is a sample data stream coming off an IoT device. It's just publishing a value. And our Project Eon, is this open source library, is charting and graphing the data coming off of it. So this is without functions. It's just simply someone doing a pubnub.publish in the background, my browser subscribing with a simple uh, Project Eon chart that's showing up. Now the cool thing is, if I go here to um, the Blocks catalog, so let me go here, I'll just, we have this thing called the Blocks catalog. And that's a set of pre-built functions and pre-built components. So one thing I like here is that, that this is one of my favorite ones. I'll scroll down, and there is this one called plot outliers on a graph. So what I want to do is this function will actually um, take that data, calculate the mean, the median, some other aspects of the data, and, and actually overlay that on the graph. Just really not, it's not doing anything to the graph specifically. It's just rewriting the message to add other values along with, with the original. So let me show you what that does. I'm going to take this, this, uh, this, this function here. I'm going to say try it now, which will clone it into my account. So it gets into my dashboard. I'm come here. I'm going to say put it in my uh, default uh, key on the API world key and say get started. So it's going to clone that into my account so I can tweak it to do anything I want with it. So now what you'll see is this code here, which is JavaScript that's calculating the median, the mean, some other stuff. And you can already see down at the bottom, this, block's not, this, this function's not running yet. But at the bottom, you can see that data that's coming in, that JSON data, that's actually um, basically just being published by that you know, sample machine in, into the network. Now what I can do is I'm going to click Start the Module. So clicking Start the Module, what's that going to do? That's going to take a copy of that JavaScript code. It's going to deploy it to all the points of presence globally and spin it up. So that'll take a few seconds. You'll see what happens if you look at the bottom in the, in the console below. After a few seconds, it will say, deploying in regions East, uh, West, Asia, Western Europe, Central Europe, and South America. And now look at the bottom, data. It's now injected mean, median, and outliers, other things into, into the data stream. 
How is it doing that? Really simple. Every time we're publishing a piece of IoT data, if you can, I don't know if you can see this on the screen here, there's something that says um, bef um, on, uh, before publish or fire. So that means this is, this is a synchronous event. It's going to stop the processing from continuing. It's going to rewrite the message and then pass it through. If I wanted to do it afterwards, I would choose after publish or fire, which would send the raw data through on its original channel, but also now republish, rewrite that message on a separate channel. Now let's see what happened to the graph. If I go back over to this graph here. Now all of a sudden, I've got more data. Right? So without actually changing the raw data coming into the network, we just added a function that's rewriting the message and the chart's automatically picking it up and charting and graphing it. And so actually if I go back over here and I turn off, where was my portal here? If I stop the module, stop this code from running, go back over here, in a few seconds, now we're just back to the original data point. So it's a really neat idea of using kind of a vented model of programming so that you're rewriting data as it goes through the network and then republishing it out. So, simple, simple case of, uh, of, of, a, of a use of a PubNub function. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? We've either completely lost them at this point, or it's just so simple. Everyone's like, I could do that. It's really, really cool. Um, so, the idea being, you know, hey, cloning an existing function, being able to rewrite it, publish it out to the network, and so on. Okay. So, what did we learn? So it's been a year. So, so first of all, uh, things happen fast. With, with PubNub and all these years, every time we launch a new piece of functionality, it usually takes about 12 months before people learn about it, embed it into their code, and ramp it. And that's happened generally with PubNub functions, with occasional big spikes. For example, one of our biggest customers, a week after we launched it, flipped a switch. They had a really immediate use for a PubNub function, and that customer is doing 2,000 TPS immediately through functions, which our ops team said, you guys promised it would take a couple of months to ramp up. Uh, but that was kind of exciting. Probably more interesting, though, is that change is hard, right? That people, they're using functions, but in reasonably simplistic ways. And this whole idea of a different software design pattern uh, isn't, isn't obvious and it isn't easy. And so going from a monolithic REST-based application to one that's completely built off of loosely coupled functions is what we want to spend a lot of time talking about today. And it's where I think we're still stumbling as application developers, as software developers, we're still uh, pretty much thinking in the, in the world of monolith, monoliths and monolithic software design. That said, you know, back in the 90s, um, there was always this debate between loosely coupled applications. I'm really dating myself. How many people remember Corba? <laughs> okay, we got at least one person. Message, uh, you know, sort of like um, uh, language independent objects. Uh, there was a lot of technology even going back 20 years ago about loosely coupled applications because it was stylistic. Now it's no longer a choice. When you're looking at the scale of what people are trying to do, millions of users, tens of millions of devices, it doesn't make sense to be funneling all your data back down to a small number of servers, scale those out as needed, process them, and republish them back out, that kind of design I showed before. So this is absolutely required. There's another reason, too. When you go to a loosely coupled software design model, which we'll talk about, um, it has, opens up huge numbers of, of huge benefits. Uh, developers can, can go faster, it's a time to market. Uh, multiple teams can work together better. Uh, there's also some risks and some unknowns. But I think that with the huge global shortage of software developers, with more and more pressure to get to market, with the need to scale beyond just throwing money at a problem, uh, this is absolutely where we're going. And so we've, we're, we're finding that our, our customers are just starting to sort of get a taste of this. And the biggest challenge is comprehension. Um, just generally in serverless, the signal to noise ratio is huge. There's a lot of buzz out there, a lot of people throwing out the word serverless, and very little concrete design patterns that we can follow. Now, my first job at a startup was in really dating myself now, 21 years ago, 96. I joined a small company called Spider Technologies, building this thing called an app server for this thing called three tier architecture, which no one had talked about back then, using a programming language no one had ever heard of called Java. So we built the first Java application server. We were eventually renamed to NetDynamics, acquired by Sun Microsystems. Very successful uh, experience. But it reminds me back then of how much what we take for granted today with LAMP stacks and mean stacks and Ruby on Rails and everything else um, is not, uh, it's not at all, uh, was not well understood 20 years ago. And I think we're going through that same transition today 
where we're saying things like serverless and loosely coupled application design, but people have no clue yet really of how to build, at least most people, a, a, a large scale loosely coupled application. And so these are kind of the things that we've learned here. Um, I'll go for one last, one last thing. What are people actually doing with PubNet functions today? We're getting a lot, it's like a, it's like a, yeah. it's like a dance club, so it was great. Um, they're either cloning uh, a function from our black box catalog to get started, or they're writing from scratch, but the kinds of things they're doing, one would be something like an app mention for chat. If you use a chat application like a Slack, and you want to talk to your friend, think about writing the code for that. Uh, chat rooms are pretty easy, but as soon as you want to start to filter, now you need to sort of filter each chat message, look up the person you're at mentioning, republish to their private channel, and before PubMed Functions, that was a lot of code, running on a, a lot of servers you had to load balance. Now it's a couple lines of code. You look up at Todd, oh, Todd's on channel 123, republish this message on channel 123. So a couple lines of JavaScript. Uh, filtering, repeating out team messages, counting votes like we talked about, uh, dropping lat long messages that are maybe not relevant. I can read all the things off the slide. One thing I find really interesting is some of our customers are starting to white label PubNet functions in a way that allows them to offer their customers customized functionality. Imagine if you sell a large uh, Slack type of application you're going to have a huge roadmap of features that those customers are going to want. And either you as the product manager are going to you know, document those, prioritize those, put in the backlog, and eventually develop those, or alternatively expose the ability for your customers to write a few lines of JavaScript and change the way their chat rooms behave, for example. The same thing goes with certain kinds of games and other experiences. So this idea of being able to, to have our customers expose functions for their customers has been an interesting approach as well. I'll stop there, and we'll jump into the next section about sort of defining, but yeah, go ahead. So uh, you talked about uh, functions being in JavaScript. Do right? you also support uh, like native uh, languages like iPhone apps or Android apps where I want to deliver a similar capability? Yeah, great question. So the JavaScript I talked about is simply running on our edge in our network. So when you publish, say, a code that filters out a lot long from, a, from an iPhone, for example, or, or maybe rewrites it to have an address or whatever, that code actually doesn't execute on the devices themselves. When we say at the edge using PubNub terminology, we're talking about the points of presence where we consume that data and all of our different data centers around the world. So we have, actually as PubNub, we have 77 SDKs now, so that same PubSub uh, sort of approach to, to sending and receiving data to and from our network works on everything from PIC32 chipsets to Android phones to, to iPhones. The, the, the processing, the intermediary processing and event triggering of the data itself happens in the network. And today we support only JavaScript in the network, though we have other languages coming as well. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so, so if that's the model, then how is it different from a server-based uh, architecture? Because you're still processing in Great question. So actually, that's a, that's a good transition to our next section. Is, yeah. uh, the short answer, though, is that I, I think I like your analogy. You talked about the onion, yeah, right? Yeah. So you want to Yeah, so the way we see this, uh, I certainly see this happening a lot uh, at Microsoft now and before I went to Microsoft when I was working in uh, sort of the IoT space and smart grid, smart meter, is that what you have are concentric rings of connectivity, of, of capability. This is actually a very good IoT analogy. The very edge is the thing in your pocket or the thermostat on the wall. There are going to be some things that just run there. Uh, that's, that's not even the edge. That's really, some of those things won't even be connected to the internet. As you get closer, you'll get to gateway type devices that have some processing capability that are connected to a network. And then after that, you get to really kind of the, the edge of the cloud where you can put some processing, which is, this is pretty, pretty new and interesting because PubNub came at this problem from the exact opposite direction that Microsoft did and, and, and Amazon, which is that we went from the core, from the center of the cloud, and if you look at something like Azure or AWS, you're picking a region to run something in. And like, here's your data center. It's in this place. And when you get something like PubNub, you're saying, well, I want these PubNub functions to run at the edge before I get to that data center. And I don't want everything to necessarily have to go through that data center. Because sometimes you'll have things at the edge that want to talk to other stuff close to them at the edge. And sometimes you do want things to go all the way to the core. Um, but so these sort of concentric rings of where you put what functionality 
is kind of an interesting piece, and I, I, I actually think all these pieces are starting to fit together better to sort of show what these architectures really look like. Sort of like the expanded problem of, uh, if any of you remember, or maybe are even still using stored procedures, there used to be a huge debate over, to my business logic go into the database in a stored procedure? Should I put it in a separate, you know, over here? Should I put it out, you know, in, in the JavaScript? You know, so there was this debate then. Now it's, it's just what Dan was talking about. Is it on my end device? Is it in the gateway at the home or in the business? Is it on the edge? So, yeah, it's still, the, the code we're talking about in functions is absolutely still running in a data center. But the difference is it's running in many, many different data centers as close to an internet connection as possible and for small amounts of processing. If you're going to do heavyweight machine learning, if you're going to do you know, heavyweight an an analytics uh, storage, that's where you're bringing it down to that core that Dan was talking about. And so understanding when and how, it's very, very obvious now in the world of REST and, and other three-tier where you put stuff, and I think that's what's changing now. Who here is using any sort of container technology right now? And are you using it for sort of developer workflow, or are you using it for ops as like a handoff to where your stuff runs in production? Developer workflow? Anyone just to go faster as a developer? Okay, and how about who's, who's deploying containers into production right now? Okay, yeah, so a bit of a split. So this is kind of one aspect that people are calling serverless. Uh, I don't want to get involved in a religious debate, but I'm not sure how much I say that serverless. That's, there are still servers there. Like you're still orchestrating servers. Uh, it's getting much better than doing VMs or physical machines, but you're kind of still there. So the inflection point we see here now is that containers are really increasingly in the enterprise being adopted as a, as a hard handoff between uh, development and operations teams. So that is actually what's kind of stressing this idea of how you do container orchestration, container management, container registry, uh, and deployment aspects of containers. So this is something people do actually call serverless quite a bit. Um, I'm not 100% sure if I buy it. I really buy the developer productivity thing big time. It's a lot easier to get something working on your own machine when you can pull all these containers together. Uh, once you get to crossing containers, I don't know, you're getting into an interesting space. Uh, the other aspect that's nice and why people kind of like the container approach that I see is they, they feel like they can get some cross-cloud portability with that or, or run things on-prem or in the cloud. Uh, that might be true. It might not. I'm not 100% sure how I feel about it. Uh, functions as a service is, is another one. This one's kind of funny, but now it's just called FAS. Um, who is using any of the sort of function services in existence right now? The Lambda is the... Yeah, Lambda, Azure is function Azure functions. Yeah. Anything. Is interesting. Yeah, wow. Um, so what we see here, this is actually pretty interesting. A lot of the analysts kind of think that this really won't change the marketplace for another five years, four years. Um, and I can see why in the sense that this is still pretty new. And today what we have is been kind of islands of functionality. So what you have is a piece of code that you can run. And people don't really know how to tie that all together, how to make applications out of it. And then you see different aspects of it from, from across the spectrum of local functions, edge functions, and cloud functions. And we kind of don't have those in a way where it's easy to move your code between them. Like they're really, you're making a decision at the outset, where is this going to run? This is going to run in Lambda. This is going to run in Azure, something like that. So uh, that's, that's still an area for, for growth. Um, one thing that kind of confuses all this is serverless is such a good buzzword now. My marketing team loves it. Um, who, and, and they always throw this at me, paper execution. Who here thinks serverless involves paper execution? Anyone? Okay, some people. Do you think that because you think it or because someone told you it? Okay, yeah. So it's one of the, like, the engineer in me is offended by the whole concept because <laughs> it's important and I get that, but like, I don't know. I wouldn't say it's a defining sort of thing. In my mind, functions are really a stateless sort of, it's, it's really like an event handler for, for your code, right? When we're running, uh, writing web applications, like client-side JavaScript web applications, the DOM has an eventing model you can hook onto, and your code is the, is the handler. Uh, so we're at a pretty early stage for this, um, and the piece that has been missing up until now has really been the sort of event infrastructure to tie this all together. It, this is kind of the latest wave of stuff that's happening right now. Um, if you have these great event handlers and you can react to, you can run your code whenever you want, it's only as useful as the ability to trigger that code. So if you don't have an ability to react when things happen in the physical world or in other clouds or in other parts of your application, it's not really all that interesting. And that's actually where we uh, have been putting a little bit of work uh, in Microsoft that I'll get to in one second. 
But real quick, on the container stuff, I've mentioned that this is really becoming our, our handoff point. Uh, we do see, at Microsoft, we see a lot of stronger adoption into enterprise uh, environments than, than I personally thought we would have a year ago. Um, and a lot of that's around orchestration. So the, the Kubernetes uh, piece using Azure Container Service is something I see a lot of. I don't really work on that much, but it's certainly, I can see why that's a lot easier to manage than managing physical servers or even PMs. Um, but it's still pretty coarse-grained. Like, these are really what people are doing is lifting and shifting. Just because some app that you've been running in your own data center for a while is now running in containers in your own data center or in containers in someone else's data center didn't really change the core architecture of that application. So you're still having kind of uh, the app having too much knowledge of all the pieces of it, a little bit of inappropriate intimacy, as it used to be called, uh, which I swear was a technical term in the 10, 15 years ago. Um, uh, so I mentioned this, too. This is kind of the, the big place. It's interesting, when I look at this, like the serverless space, the function space in particular, I'd say if we looked in the operating systems days, this would be like DOS, like Microsoft DOS. We are, we are at the very beginning of what this is going to be. It's useful, it, you can do some very interesting stuff with it. What people are largely doing today is doing the asynchronous processing that's easy to hand off. So things like image processing, things, things that don't require you to put your core application flow at risk, the, the most useful uh, pieces that I've seen catching a lot, of, a lot of traction lately are when you are a SaaS provider or a service or app provider of some sort and you want to build extensibility in. Um, who here runs a service for a living, whether it's in your, in your organization or at a, at a startup or at a company? Like a the, SaaS service or something like that? Yeah, like a SaaS, even if it's like a, a CRM service or whatever it is, some service that people use. Not the wrong with CRM. Hey, oh yeah, <laughs> Even if it's here, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so that so the, the most dangerous thing to do is let other people run code in your process, right? Like that is, who feels happy about that? Everyone like that, Un unmanaged code running on your machines? Um, so like this is a good way to let people get the customization they want without kind of killing yourself to, to provide that for them and let them do whatever stupid things they want in their own compute. So we really do see kind of a few different aspects of this, uh, sort of generalized functions as a service. This would be really kind of where Amazon's been the leader so far. Uh, it's really built to handle you know, uh, any sort of scale. It's really optimized for cost. This is where you get the, the pay per gigabyte sec, uh, seconds and the pay per execution uh, sort of models. Um, I'm, I'm very interested to see more specialized functions as a service coming up. PubNub's the best example I've seen yet. Uh, in something that's really natively designed to run. It was first designed to run at the edge. Like we, even at Microsoft, and I know Amazon is too, we're looking for how do we get our serverless stuff into the edge, but to us, we're coming at it from the opposite direction, so it's a, a little bit interesting. Um, and then you do see kind of the hybrid stuff out there. So far, uh, I'd say my, my impression of some of that is really more about cloud portability or data center portability than really about being true serverless. Um, I don't know if you have a different opinion on that. But. Yeah, I think there's there's a vision for hybrid, but I think um, yeah, right now it's you know it's it's more of a vision. <laughs> and uh, so, how are they used today? This is a this is a good uh, sort of question. How do we see people, uh, either you or us, uh, see people using functions as a service? I mentioned this before. People are kind of just taking their normal applications and latching on extensibility to their existing applications. It's not really changed their APIs. It's not really changed the way they're building software. We're not quite there yet. It's still pretty early. Uh, there are a lot of good reasons for this. Um, you know, some of it's just kind of understanding uh, what, what you have to change to break up a monolithic application. I know in our minds, like, I know I spent a long time writing three-tier architecture type stuff, not realizing that it was still a total monolith. You know, it could run on a bunch of servers and all this stuff, but it was still conceptually monolithic. And the, the, all the wonderful work I did to organize stuff didn't really totally solve the problem. Um, so FAST is really kind of helping in small tactical areas. Uh, it, it does, it's like an overflow sort of thing. It is interesting. Um, what really hasn't changed is where does the actual rubber hit the road? Where does the, the, the pieces connect? Um, and this is where the eventing stuff comes in. When we look at these architectures, they're not really new. I mentioned the eventing in the DOM. Anyone familiar with like JavaScript frameworks and all that, like or eventing in Windows or an operating system? Like this is not new stuff. We've had this for a long time, and there's some debate as to whether SOA really was event-based or not. It was supposed to be. I, I certainly know that. A lot of it just ended up in RPC. 
Um, and there are design patterns around this that existed for a long time. Actually, if you read uh, some of the really old, I'm trying to think, like Grady Bush's books and stuff from the 90s, he'll talk about client and server and message, even though he's talking about object-oriented programming, not about distributed computing, which is pretty interesting. Um, and then sort of the, the, the way that the cloud apps are still monolithic here is that you're, you're often still relying on these IS black boxes. And we have a lot of legacy of, of everyone growing up in, in platforms like Java or .NET or something that give you all these things as long as you stay in the, in the same sandbox. So we're all kind of natively monolithic developers. The one place I'd say that's a bit different is kind of in web developers because they're a little bit more flexible. So uh, Actually, can I stop you right yeah. there? Yeah, just because I think this is the, this is a key thing. To, so before we go even in here, you know, let me just jump right back to it to 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 keep on leading into what Dan's about to talk about. So just going back to this slide, I think that all of the reasons that Dan just talked about for why functions are being used in these kind of very tactical areas, and we're keeping monolithic uh, approaches to software. One is that's what we know, but the other one is how many people here are, are there? Is their code running on someone's cloud? You know, Amazon's, Microsoft, someone else. Most people, right? Until very recently, all of the services you use, storage, compute, uh, you know, uh, any of the services, any of the 30 or 40 services that are out there, um, are, have been black boxes. You, you call it, and it's done, and it comes back with something. But it doesn't actually signal. And I think what, what I've been really excited about with what Dan's working on at Microsoft, and you're starting to see this with other clouds as well, um, I think what, what EventGrid has done is probably the most interesting, just giving you a good lead-in, but I think it's really key, um, is instrumenting various cloud uh, services within Azure to have them fire events. And then I'll just lead into that, but just a quick point to that. Do you remember when I was showing you the function that, that we wrote that was adding the mean and the median and stuff to that graph, right? And it was triggering on an event called uh, on before publish or before publish. What was that? That was actually PubNub's network having a contract with you and saying, every time someone publishes a message, I'm going to fire an event that you can hook onto. That's giving you access to the internals of how PubNub works and letting you do whatever the heck you want when, when, that, when, that, when that event fires. So we've kind of exposed the internals to some extent of how PubNub works to you to allow you to hook on whatever you want to do. And imagine if you do that not just with, with, a, with a company like PubNub, but with an entire set of cloud services like what exists inside Azure or in AWS or something like that. And I think that's where when you get there, when you have an event firing an event-driven cloud architecture, you can totally change the way your apps are built. So I'll stop there, but I think that's, the, that's a really key point. I just want to make sure it didn't get missed. That is the lead-off point there, actually. And so that's kind of where we fall into eventing in the cloud. Uh, and, and what's this really look like is you sort of have five components here. And, and though this, is, uh, this product, EventGrid, is an Azure product, uh, Serverless Inc. actually released Event Gateway right after we released this. And their design is very, very similar. We didn't work together on them. We feel good that we both feel good that we've landed on similar ideas. And that's it. The most important thing is the event. What happened? The event is the first class citizen here. It's not secondary. What you have here are event publishers. So these would be services in any cloud provider, even in your application, uh, that are actually doing stuff. And the event is being published from them. So where it took place is the event publisher. Topics are this idea, very thin lines you can barely see. Uh, that are where publishers send the things that happen. So I'm S3, I just uploaded a file, someone uploaded a file into a storage bucket. I'm uh, uh, Cosmos DB and someone just put something in a document collection. Um, and it's where uh, publishers send those events and then it's where subscribers, people interested in those events can go listen for them. So those are what event subscriptions are, it's how you receive the events. And the handlers are the service or thing that's reacting to those events. That's the piece we have kind of pretty well so far with Lambda and with Azure Functions and, and other compute stuff and with PubNub Functions. But what we haven't really had is a good generic way to do all of this. Uh, so I think, uh, ah, yes, yes. And this is kind of where the rubber meets the road before I do a demo, is when you have IaaS services become event-driven and other cloud services become event-driven, now cloud-based application architectures will completely change because the monoliths will break down. And, and when we say open, I mean like, I'll show you in a second, we don't put limits on where the events go in Azure because we believe in a multi-cloud world. We know this is going to be very strange. I'm not that, I haven't been at Microsoft that long, only a couple of years. Very strange to say, we don't think everyone's going to just use our cloud. Like that's an unrealistic assumption, we know that. So we need to be able to work with other clouds and we really need to be able to help people kind of unlock value 
uh, by using these. Uh, if you look at a use case, which I'll show a quick, quick sample of, if you use something like a mobile live image stream, uh, in the past, if you wanted to upload cat photos or something, you'd have some sort of server that you're uploading those fo photos to. You're probably doing some OpenCV processing to make sure there's nothing inappropriate there, to tag them, to put some metadata in, and uh, you're actually going to then go put those in a place that people in their, their mobile app can go search. You probably start this off in a pretty simple way, all on one server, all in one web server or something. And you'll break it up over time because if it's not going to scale really well. And you'll do polling stuff to say, okay, hey, when I really need to scale, now I'll put a queue work item in a queue somewhere and someone will read from that and, and do the processing. But as you get to event-based programming, you can really do things like start, stop writing code that's, that's plumbing, that's just telling, hey, workers, you know there's more work items to do, and start writing code that's just your actual logic. So in this example, uploading a, a, a file to some sort of cloud storage, and you're running some sort of uh, serverless function in that cloud provider, and that actual function, doing something like tagging images and updating metadata, the actual like, storing of that image, or the storing of that metadata, which is happening in one function, can actually trigger an event that leaves that cloud provider, goes to something like PubNub, or goes to another cloud provider, and enables this sort of last mile connectivity to people in their applications, whether those are mobile browsers or things like thermostats. And so the, the user experience here benefits a lot because you're not spending this time polling. These like sort of layered go through work queue architectures look pretty, which we all probably use. Anyone use SQS or any sort of queuing system? Yeah, like that's how the world works. Uh, it's pretty good, but I mean over time those things add up and they kind of result in a bad experience. So real quick, since I'm running near the end of this, I kind of wanted to show uh, what it looks like to do uh, event-based publishing in Azure and with, with uh, PubNub, actually, of all things. Yeah, so this, this demo of Dan setting up, um, the idea is to, you know, a very simple image processor where someone uploads an image, um, it automatically will fire an event, right? So Azure can fire an event and says, oh, image was uploaded. That can be handled by anyone listening to that event, because the nice thing about these things is they're loosely coupled. The service that fires the event doesn't care who's listening. In this case, PubNub happens to be listening. And it says, oh, okay, I'm going to take that event, and what am I going to do? I'm going to take the image URL, and I'm going to publish it out to everyone interested in that tag, let's say kitty cats. And so now any device subscribing on a socket listening to kitty cats will get a new image, or at least an image URL, which can then turn around and just go download the image as it sees fit. Without any kind of servers running, without any kind of code, you built yourself a scalable kind of secure way of uh, pushing images into a system, automatically notifying potentially millions of, of interested subscribers and going from there. Does anyone know what request bin is? Anyone ever see this before? It's a really cool community-run project, just to let you see what's in HTTP requests. I'm actually going to just show you how, how open cloud this is. I'm creating a request bin. It's free. You just go there, requestb.in. And uh, I copied the URL. I'm going to go to an Azure storage account. Uh, Event Grid is being added to all the services in Azure. It's actually something we use in the plumbing behind. Can I actually see the, thanks to the screen resolution, can you guys see that? Yeah. Can you reduce it or is it too Let me uh, see if I can reduce this. All right. Uh, that's going to be kind of ugly. Yeah, no big deal if you can. Well, just, just imagine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll shotgun through this and I'll reduce it when we get to the next one. Um, so if I just make like a, a, uh, a webhook that I want this to, to land on. Who uses webhooks? Anyone familiar with those, right? Slack, anything like that? Yeah, GitHub, all using webhooks. Uh, we're trying to make webhooks not painful. Uh, so here's an example of making request bin work uh, with Azure's webhooks through, through uh, EventGrid. You can see here what I did was I, I registered that just so we don't give you a uh, spam cannon that can destroy the world uh, or DDoS cannon. We actually make you do a registration step here. And uh, now that I've got this in there, uh, I can go upload files into this storage account and trigger things to happen. So like this, when I go upload a picture of myself will actually uh, tell RequestBin, hey look, you've got, you've got some, something that's happened. I'll find a picture of myself, I'll upload this, and if I come back to my RequestBin, I can actually see that uh, the event, oh, hit upload, awesome, there we go. I can actually see that that event has actually fired now to tell me here's a, a file that came. I mentioned the topic, that's what had happened, that's my Azure storage account. Uh, it's some event that's about Azure Storage, 
And if I look at the payload here, I can actually see the, the URL for the image that was uploaded, which is that picture of Dan. Um, now, really easily, I can actually go start using this with PubNub. And uh, I can actually start this like totally from scratch, or I can, in the interest of time, maybe run through the function I have. I'll just run through a function I have on here. Uh, and if I look at it, this is in PubNub's functions world. Uh, what's cool about this is we didn't work together, and I told you that we need an auth step to not DDoS people. Uh, but I can actually come here in PubNub and, and click copy URL for a function. And now I actually can get the URL to this function to be web callable. And this function's pretty easy. It's just going to check if this is a registration event. If it is, it's going to do the auth dance. And if it's not, it's just going to publish this to PubNub, the, the, the image that was uploaded, so it can be pushed to browsers and other things within the PubNub network. And now if I come back to my uh, Azure account, I can actually come here, go back to the storage account, go to Event Grid, and add a subscription. And like I said, we don't care what it is. Uh, I'll do PubNub, sub, and uh, I can just paste in the endpoint. I can actually say here if I just want like create events or delete events. There's prefix matching, all this fun stuff. There's been a lot published. I don't need to tell you about it. Um, and once this is done here, I come back to PubNub and I will see that the auth dance is happening. Uh, this thing will tell me when it gets the auth request. It got it right there. And now it's listening. And now I can actually come back to this storage account and upload files as I see fit. And assuming this works, I am holding in my laptop here, but this is just a, a browser. Subscribe to that channel he's publishing to. So what's happening is an image may get uploaded in, into Azure. That's going to trigger, a, a trigger an event that Pub is listening for, thanks to the, the, the clicking and the pasting of that URL in. And so it's, it, this is subscribing on that topic, on that channel, right? So as soon as the picture uploads, um, boom, it shows up there, right? And what's cool about that, everyone got that? Want to do it again? <laughs> Can everyone see my dog? <laughs> let's do another one. So now I'm out of good pictures. <laughs> let's talk about how you would have built that monolithically and what the, some of the challenges would be. Yeah. So when you would build this monolithically, you would say, okay, well, I'm going to do this in my data center or whatever. I'm not knocking any data providers here. It's just this is my pieces. And then people, when they are in their app, they will be polling to see what's changed. And that's not, like that last mile is not a polling step here. The image processing is not a polling step here. There is, there is no polling actually happening. This is all push-based. On the PubNub side, I think that's through a WebSocket. Uh, on our side, it's through a webhook. And what you're really doing is changing the architecture to sort of be like you would see in a waterfall diagram of these discrete steps happen, and the next step just instantly kicks off after that. So you're kind of turning around the model of step one, step two, step three, step four, to just being a reaction of chain of, of events, just like you would in sort of a UI programming model. So think about like just walking through, um, walking through what, what actually just happened, right? If you were going to build this yourself, you would run it in a written code in whatever your favorite programming language was. You'd be, you'd be accepting posts of images. You would turn around, store that, write metadata to a database, then turn around and figure out how you're going to build the front end user facing interface, whether it's polling based or the phone checks when it needs to, receive those, and as Dad said, probably split those into two different components that you could scale separately, monitor, run, operationalize. And then if other teams wanted to come in and interact with those, um, with those URLs, uh, you know, with, those, with, the, with, the, with the data, with everything else, um, you'd probably have to build an integration point to that team, figure out a security model between those. And um, with this, uh, the only code you really saw was some handler code inside a PubNub function to republish it out to the devices, uh, the JavaScript code to display it, and everything else is auto-scalable, secure, and, and the, probably the best part I think that our bigger companies are really interested in is the fact that multiple dev teams now can simultaneously um, subscribe to those events, subscribe to those streams of data, and work simultaneously together. So it's a, it's a huge difference in terms of how you think about development, but it's not happening, I think, overnight. It's going to take people some time as things like EventGrid and other cloud triggers and, and events get fired from all, lots of other infrastructure. So there's a lot happening there, but I think that's... We're getting the time flag back there. Oh, yeah, um, sorry. Any, this was great. Thank you. Any, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more like question or statement. I can see this really nice for real-time application. It will make a lot more, more sense, much more sense, if you can actually replay events that were last driven in the past 10, 20 minutes. Because otherwise, if you open the app and you want to see the last 10 images, there's no way you will receive those events. So you still have a monolithic kind of a structure. 
So that's a good question. So the question was, well, this seems really good for real time, but what if I wanted to get the last 10 or 20 events? Actually, no. So the nice thing about PubNub is because we saw this back in 2012 was one of the big things. We have a time sequenced set of history of the events that have been fired. So actually, what you do is when you, when you start up that app, you just call a PubNub.history and replay events from uh, however far back you want to go. However long you're, you're, you've, you decided to store 24 hours up to forever. And you just replay those events up to now. And aside from the context of something like PubNub, the other uh, pattern for this is I'm pretty confident that all the eventing platforms out there uh, will, will start to do things like publish to Accuse, uh, things like that for, for Grid, for Event Grid, or publish to Azure Event Hubs, which is really a Kafka type service. So you can replay events all you want. You can have multiple subscribers, so all events go here, some events go there. And the other thing to keep in mind though is that events aren't quite the same as telemetry. This is a hot debate right now actually within Microsoft about like pretty much everything is telemetry and, and data you want, but events are really things that are independent and, and actionable. Uh, so you like me clicking a button is an event. Me walking into this room is an event. All the other stuff that happens in between, you know, it's also telemetry, but there's more stuff than just me clicking the button. Great Any question. Any other questions? Okay, so no more questions, she's saying. No more questions. All right, well, we can stick around afterwards if you guys do have any other questions. Um, thank you guys so much for the time. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys.